Hello, Yasmina. Oh, thanks. So thanks everyone for joining in today. Um, as always, I, every time I give a talk, I think to myself how privileged I am to be able to do this. So thanks again to O'Reilly for this um, incredible opportunity and to you um, for joining me today in this uh, webcast. As, as she said earlier, my name is Sandra Pagella. Um, my Twitter account is M A Pagella, that's P A G E L L A. My personal website, where I, I post articles and tutorials um, of, of web development and game development, uh, is andrepagella.com. And um, you can usually find me in um, BBG, that's on, on IRC Freenode.net. It's uh, a channel full of game developers. If you're interested in game development, I um, recommend it. So, about me, um, I have been developing software for the web for over 12 years. I have done back-end, front-end things, um, mobile and desktop application development. But mostly I have tried to focus myself on making web apps, um, so that's my background. Um, I love game development, doing game development, playing games. I am a gamer myself, and I love to solve interesting challenges and problems and mess around with experimental technologies such as uh, the Microsoft Kinect um, simulations, data visualizations, and so on. And I am the author of Making Isometric Social Real-Time Games with HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript. So, let's begin. Um, let's discuss for a minute the current scenario. Um, it's a great time to be a front-end uh, web developer. And there's lots of innovation happening lately, and big, big companies such as Mozilla, Google, Apple, Opera, and Microsoft are pushing the boundaries of what we can do inside the browser forward. So I think it's a great time to focus on front-end web development uh, and back-end as well, but I like front-end personally. So it's even better if you're interested in game development, and the reason for this is that with HTML5, we are getting access to new and incredibly powerful APIs, APIs. and uh, every single week or so, we can notice that new APIs are being released all the time, so it's um, a moving target, and the performance of JavaScript engines in all browsers uh, is improving all the time, and um, and such. It's evolving and maturing very, very fast, and that's a good thing. We want it to keep evolving at this rate. It's very important. Now, it's very easy to get started with front-end web development and with game development using web technologies. The point of entry is very low, okay? There are lots of good articles and tutorials out there. Um, even for those of you who are not coming from a software development, a development background, or rather a game development background either, um, there are lots of documentations and examples available everywhere. And uh, there's an enormous community of developers behind HTML5 that in most cases uh, are going to be very helpful. So, no other platform in the world uh, has a market size this big. Not Flash, not Java, not iOS, not Android. The market size of HTML5, it truly is massive, okay? It's massively big. It has an enormous reach, okay? And it runs practically everywhere. It runs on PCs, it runs on smartphones, on tablets, and in the near future, even on TVs and game consoles such. 
uh, game consoles such as the Xbox. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if you give it time, even toasters will include support for JavaScript. <laughs> so this obviously leads us to ask ourselves, why are people making Flash or native games again? And that's a perfectly good and reasonable question if you ignore the massive reach of HTML5 apps and games, obviously. And the main excuses that these developers have against HTML5 are, for example, how do I protect my IP, my intellectual property? And um, let's discuss each topic in detail. IP protection for, for HTML5 apps is an ongoing subject of research nowadays. And um, some people are even developing solutions to handle everything in a server and stream things down to clients on demand, like a VNC or a remote desktop connection. And there are perfectly good arguments on both sides. Okay, those that want to keep the web completely open and the ones that need to protect for perhaps legal reasons or whatever reasons, they need to protect their intellectual property. And we need to listen to both and somehow develop something in between that can work on both cases. However, some developers are, are still choosing Flash or going native to avoid being in this kind of situation. And by this kind of situation, I mean vulnerable to, vulnerable to IP theft, um, which is weird since you can decompile SWF files very easily. But in order to protect that problem, to combat that problem, they are resorting to use code obfuscation. But uh, we already have that in JavaScript. So go figure. So some components are very buggy or not supported at all. Um, and well, some platforms, it, it is true, somewhat true, some platforms support some APIs and others support others. Okay, so there's a lot of fragmentations, uh, fragmentation problems out there. And I won't lie to you, audio is a still a big, big problem, okay? Especially for web game developers is still trying to, to support um, mobile devices. And um, there are audio channel limitations. You can only reproduce a very limited amount of our sound files at each time. So it's complex. It's a complex problem to, hold, to, to solve. However, there are many ways to handle these problems, and we're going to be discussing some strategies that you might be able to use to avoid them, okay, to avoid some of these limitations. The next is tools are primitive or non-existent. Okay, well, tools are primitive and non-existent. Uh, to make games using HTML5, um, depends. Um, personally, I think that the current tools and production pipelines, pipelines are adequate. They are not exactly ideal for game development, but they are adequate, especially if you're in indie game development, like most of you are. 80% um, of or 90% of uh, HTML5 web game developers are independent. But some companies such as Adobe, as incredible as that may sound, are working hard to finish some products that will make all jobs easier in the future. And the AAA companies, well, AAA companies are not really worry about them because they have the resources, they have the, the developers and the tools to develop their own toolkits, okay? 
um, with the savings that you can make by not porting your game to all the different platforms, okay, they can develop their own set of tools. So it's definitely possible. You just have to look around and, uh, for example, there's Gameloft, which is developing some YGL games uh, currently. Um, uh, so that's an example of a big company uh, developing web games. And the last excuse is extremely low performance compared to native or flash apps. And uh, this remains true for the moment, okay, but we're getting there. Just we need to give it time. We need to give browser developers time and eventually they will get us much closer to the current speed of native apps. So in the meantime, we'll have to find another, another way to make our games run, um, run fast, okay? So, this leads us to, let, let's do a, a small recap, let, let me go back. Um, let's do a small, a small recap. We have some fragmentation problems, partly because um, you know, some devices support some APIs and other devices or platforms support other APIs. And ideally, we need to support an enormous amount of platforms that are very different from each other. Okay? Uh, the screens on some devices are very small, while on other devices are extremely large. Um, we also need to remember that our games um, will be played in a lot of different contexts. So, for example, one user might play our game in the middle of a meeting, okay, another in the bathroom, or another in the living room. So, we need to somehow take the context into account when we design our games. And let's also remember that some devices might support one audio channel, while others might support multiple audio channels and, you know, it supports um, playing uh, many sounds simultaneously. So, this whole situation rings a bell. And the reason why is because we have already been through here. I mean, okay, we have already already been through this particular set of problems in the past, and these are some screenshots of, of the uh, configuration screens in old games. Okay, if you're more than perhaps 18 years old, you probably remember at least one of these screens. So before you began a game. Um, Basically, you have to choose your sound card and your graphics card. So um, you, needed, you needed to configure your game to run on your particular computer. And it was hard and sometimes even impossible to automatically detect some settings. So they preferred to prompt the user, okay, what do you want to do, you know, in this particular case. And um, to make it even worse, <laughs> some cards, uh, for example, graphics cards or sound, uh, sound cards, were generic. And by generic, this usually meant that it worked with the, using the device drivers of another, perhaps, more popular card. Um, and I remember that I had a generic sound card that used the uh, device drivers of Creative's Sound Blaster, which is, uh, by the way, was brilliant at the time. But obviously, it was extremely unintuitive. Okay, we can do much better nowadays. And imagine if Angry Birds or FarmBuild had these uh, configuration screens. No one will play them, right? 
So nowadays, people expect you to resolve all these conflicts automatically. Okay? Just make it work. That's what they say. Okay? I don't care. Just make it work, make it run, and make it run fast. And they are probably right. So, how do game developers solve these problems? And they picked several strategies, and we're going to be discussing them one by one, but um, we need to pick the lowest common denominator. And by lower common denominator, I mean choosing your base your base device. In conventional game development, I'm guessing that you could call it the minimum requirements. Okay, so we need to pick a baseline, okay, our minimum requirements, and work from that point on. And the reason behind this is that if it works here, if it works on, on the least capable device, it works everywhere. And um, some people usually ask me, okay, what should I do? Should I do graceful degradation versus progressive enhancement? Uh, what do these things mean, right? And what they mean by graceful degradation or progressive enhancement is you can either make a very basic game that works on um, a very a, a low capability device and improve it depending on if the device uh, is faster or not. Or you can either start with a very complex and feature complete game and gracefully degrade to support older devices. And I personally, personally, I prefer to use progressive enhancement. Um, but it really depends on your main target, okay? So remember that you can either make a desktop game that works on mobile, or you can do a mobile game that works on desktop. So you have two strategies that you can pick. And remember that depending if you're using a mobile device or a desktop, desktop device, the experiences and the contexts under which these games are being played are completely different, usually. So you either make a desktop game that works on your mobile phones and tablets and so on, or you make a mobile game, okay, you make a game for your mobile phone, that happens to work on desktop computers. And um, we can also auto-detect device capabilities. But we should always, always give the user the tools to change it whenever they want, okay? And uh, obviously, there are many ways to auto-detect if the current device supports feature A or B. And you can either do it manually or resort to a framework such as Modernizer. So let me see, I'm getting a, a weird message here. Right. So um, sometimes, um, especially with, within Android, you're going to notice that the difference in performance are huge, OK? There are many ways to auto-detect how capable our device is, and we're going to be discussing uh, one possible strategy that you could use uh, later on. So we can also we, we need to use clever te techniques, and we'll be discussing uh, these techniques later on. So lowest common denominator, and by lowest common denominator, what I what I mean is really mobile, obviously. You should, if possible, you should always aim for mobile, okay? Never try to develop for desktop and then 
gracefully degrade until you make it work on mobile. And you need to aim, like I said before, for the least capable platform. And in, in mobile, in the mobile world, that's unfortunately Android 2.3 nowadays, okay? Um, but you can still perhaps aim your game at, um, you know, you, you can make it perhaps work just on iOS devices. It depends on what you need to do and on what you want to do. And if, you're, if you aim for, for the Android 2.3 platform, you need to work it, you need to make it work well in the default Android browser, okay? And this particular point, when I say mobile, mobile obviously, this is a critical point, okay? Uh, it's absolutely critical. When I mean mobile, I mean smartphones and tablets, okay? I think that we all know what what I'm talking about, but you cannot ignore mobile. If you're, perhaps you're thinking, okay, you know what, um, WebGL doesn't work on the iPhone nor on iOS, um, and it, it only works on some Android devices, so I think I'm going to aim for desktop computers. Don't do that, you're missing out on an enormous market, okay? You're just missing out. And um, I'm pretty sure that you've heard about a new term that's been mentioned quite often uh, lately, and that's mobile first. You need to design your websites mobile first. And this mobile first philosophy means that you first design your website to look right on mobile devices, and you improve it if you are on a more capable device with a larger screen, okay, like a desktop computer. And this mobile first philosophy, it applies to web games as well, okay? Web games, whether you like it or not, are still pages. Okay, are still websites. Very complex applications, very, com very complex web applications, but in the heart of it, they are still web apps. And uh, what's even worse is that if you aim for desktop, I'm pretty sure that you must have noticed that we are making an, an a slow transition from desktop to mobile. Okay, so Firefox Mobile, by the way, works well on Android. So always aim for the default Android browser. Um, where was I? All right, so, right. <laughs> I got lost uh, for a minute. If we aim for, for mobile, we need to keep three things in mind the loading times, the rendering speed, and the application responsiveness, okay? Mobile devices, as complex as they may look, and as advanced as they may be, they are still, you know, not very capable. They are not very fast. So we need to be careful with the approach we take when we implement things. But let's talk about these particular topics um, one by one. When I talk about improving loading times, that we need to keep loading times in mind, um, we have, uh, mo the, the mobile world usually has a somewhat good download bandwidth, okay? But it has a terrible latency. And this basically means that um, it has good download speeds, but it takes a lot of time until we can reach servers. That's basically it. And in order to improve the loading times, we need to lower, obviously, 
um, the amount of requests. Okay, we need to somehow eliminate the latency. We need to somehow download as much as we can in a single batch. Okay, and server side web performance optimization techniques might help us do this, but we can also try to pack as many things as possible. Okay, we need to pack as many things as po are possible. And in the gaming world, in the game development world, um, some strategies that they use for unrelated reasons may provide unintended benefits for us web developers, okay, or web game developers. So, for example, I think that we, if you have worked with um, the web in the past, I'm pretty sure that you have heard the term sprite sheet. And a sprite sheet is um, just many images um, inside a single image, okay? That's a sprite sheet. And in the case of our games, a sprite sheet is, for example, the image that you have um, in the current slide to your left. In this case, it's a character walking. Okay, it's, uh, it's walking around, and we have the entire animation uh, on a single image, on a single file. So instead of having to request multiple images, we can reduce the number of requests by just packing things in a single file. And we can do similar things with uh, sound files. So for example, if we have several sounds and we need to play several sounds in our website or in our game, we can combine sounds, therefore forming what is usually called a sound sheet or an audio sprite. Okay, we can combine sounds. And this technique allows us to solve um, a very particular problem. Remember that on mobile, we can only reproduce one sound at a time. And I don't know if you remember cassette tapes, that you could rewind or forward the tape. Well, we can basically do the same using sound sprites, you know, audio sprites. Uh, we can use a similar technique and download all the sounds in a single file and they use just a single audio object to access that file in different times, therefore playing different sounds. Obviously, uh, we still, still can't reproduce uh, two sounds or more simultaneously on mobile, but for, you know, if you just need to play a soundtrack, it, it works just fine. Um, iOS 6, which came out two days ago, might solve some of these problems, okay? Um, it includes a very buggy implementation of the uh, Web, Audio, Web Audio Data API which allows us to um, play sounds with low latency and to manipulate sounds. Um, so it's, uh, that's really great. Um, but it's a very buggy for the moment. We, I still can't say much about it. It came out two days, uh, two days ago. And uh, if you're interested in audio sprites or using sound sheets, or play multiple sounds in either desktop or mobile devices. Um, some people have already been working on this problem, especially Zynga, Zynga, the game developer that makes Farmville and Cityville and so on, um, made an open source tool called Jukebox. And Jukebox basically tries to solve many audio audio issues in mobile devices. For the rest, you can use Sound Manager 2, that Sound Manager 
to that tries to play uh, sounds using HTML5, but if HTML5 is not supported, it falls back to Flash, and your sounds are played every time. Another technique that we can use to improve loading times is to, oops, this image is not loading for some reason. Well, that's a shame. Let me go back and forward. All right. So, for some reason, this image is not being displayed, but height maps, what um, they are, oh, there it is, there it is. There it is, all right, perfect. Height maps allows you to basically encode information inside an image. And they are usually, oh, right, there it is. So, um, they usually, um, they are usually used to encode uh, height information inside a 2D bitmap file, okay? So in this case, the image on the left is being used to generate the 3D terrain on the right, okay? So we can notice that the brighter spots means that the terrain should be higher and the darker spots that it should be, it should be lower. And we can use a similar technique um, by basically using a similar concept, which is to encode information inside uh, an image. And in this case, what might look like a randomly generated image is actually nine by nine different levels. Okay, so we know that each level has 32 pixels of uh, width by 20, 24 pixels of height each. And we can basically um, grab one of these levels and then we can start processing these images using the get image data um, method of the canvas object, of the HTML5 canvas object, all right? And then we can ask, all right, if my, uh, if the current pixel is white, then it's part of a wall. If it's red, it's an enemy base. If it's blue, it's uh, an enemy. And if it's green, and you get the idea. And we can encode several pieces of information using basically this format here, all right? Now, let's discuss paint operations, all right? And um, paint operations are the most expensive process to run in a game, or rather, one of the most expensive processes to run in a game. Um, and that's especially true in mobile devices, right? Uh, so what's the strategy here? We need to somehow try to minimize calls to the paint function. We need to minimize calls to the paint function. Um, we can't use WebGL, at least not if we want to, if we are aiming for mobile devices and that means iOS uh, and, um, and Android. And also, it's not supported in Microsoft Internet Explorer. So we can't use WebGL, at least for now. So what are our options then? Okay, we can either use DOM, okay, the DOM, the document object model, pure HTML, um, combined with CSS3 code. Canvas, the HTML5 canvas object, or SVG, okay, vector images. We can use one of these three methods to render graphics 
for a game. And when people, um, let me, when I talk to other people about this particular subject, they usually say, I prefer to use DOM, or I prefer to use Canvas because it's more flexible. Um, now, we need to, we have DOM, we have DOM, we have Canvas, and we have SVG. Why do we need to pick a single one? We need to embrace that flexibility, okay? Why do you need to pick just one? We can combine the power of Canvas, the flexibility of Canvas. We can combine the performance of the document object model, and it's, it's very easy to use, and it doesn't need to be rendered uh, every 60 seconds, uh, sorry, every 60 milliseconds. So there's no need to pick just one. We can use all three. You can cheat. Who cares? As long as your game runs well, you can cheat. You're allowed to cheat. And actually, let me encourage you to cheat to make your game look great. Cheat if that's necessary. And um, this is another tip. Most to the games, most to the games, I'm talking about perhaps more than 75% of genres, of to the genres, can be developed easily using grids, to the grids, you know, just a, a matrix of objects. That's it. It's very, very easy to get started with. And knowing this, um, for example, I have seen developers doing this, all right? They need to present uh, a three by three grid, and in this case, they are painting, they are painting every single cell of the grid, okay? And uh, obviously the green part is the viewport, the visible area. The rest of the grid is not seen. Now, other people might do it a bit better, and they might say, all right, no, that's, that's wrong. Um, oops, hold on. Oops, let's go. And, well, other people might say, okay, that's wrong, okay? You actually need to ask if the current cell is uh, inside the viewport before you, uh, inside your loop, you know. Otherwise, you're just painting cells that are not being rendered on the screen. And, uh, well, that's okay, but what happens if you try this same problem using one million rows and one million columns? And here's the tip, it won't work, at least not using that approach. What you actually need to do, let me skip the rendering, all right. What you actually need to do is to use just four extra lines. Just four extra lines, you need to just add four extra lines. And these lines basically ask, give me um, the cell, okay, the, the first cell on the top left of the screen, give me the cell, uh, the position of the cell in the bottom left of the screen, on the right, um, on the right part of the screen, and on on the top right part of the screen and on the bottom right part of the screen. And you just cycle through the elements you need, and that's it. And in this way, you can basically process massive amounts of information, okay? There's no need to go through the entire thing. You need to process exactly what you need, okay? Don't focus on low-level optimizations until you get this part right, okay? And if I show you 
a graph of the improvements that you can make. This is all discussed in my book if you're interested. But um, if I show you the, the performance differences between all three approaches, you'll notice that the first approach got zero uh, frames per second using a uh, 2500 by 2500 uh, cells, um, a 2500 by 2500 grip. And the second approach only got something like uh, seven frames per second. And the other, the last one, that just processed the cells you needed, um, got 83 frames per second. Um, I'm using, by the way, um, I'm using set timeout to record this, um, this, ben this benchmark. Another trick that you can use um, to optimize paint operations and to reduce the amount of, um, of pixels that you clear and that you paint. And do you, or rather, does any remember Commander Keen? Commander Keen was one of the first, if not the first, um, to the platform of its time, okay? It was truly one of the first to the platformers. It was developed by John Carmack um, and ID Software, all right, a game studio. And back then, computers were, were very, very slow. And if they needed to render these graphics at, I, I don't remember how many frames per second they used, but if they needed to render each, each one of these screens, you know, the entire screens, that game wouldn't work. In order to prove it, in order to make it work, they invented or actually they implemented something called adaptive tile refresh. And the basic idea is that you basically define your grid. You paint it once. And then when you move something, you detect the, the cells that have changed and that should be repainted. And you only repaint what you need and you leave the rest intact, okay? And it's interesting because, um, by the way, adaptive tile refresh, that algorithm, is usually called dirty rectangles. Like its differences are negligible. So you can either call it, call it adaptive tile refresh or you can call it dirty rectangles. It's the same thing. Paint operations. Let's continue. There's another technique that we can use. It's called layering or doing compositing work. Basically, you define two different layers. There's a static layer that only gets painted once. And then there's an animated layer, which is the one that's being rendered um, 60 times per second. And the, um, let me ask yourself, who says they need to be on the same canvas object? We can cheat, like I said before, we can cheat and put them in different canvas objects, okay? If we are completely sure that the static layer won't have to be repainted um, all the time, we can just place it in a different layer and Use, we can use one layer for, for the static things and another layer for the animated things. So that's a very, a very common technique. And once you combine both results, you basically uh, get this, okay? Um, you get the van in the middle of the field. And we can use um, a similar approach but instead of using images, we can use videos. 
Yes, we can use basically combine objects and video. And we can put them in two different layers, right? So for example, on the left, there's a, a uh, in this case, it's a static image. But imagine if that were like uh, a flyby, a flyby video of a plane going through the sky. You know, it's it would be animated. And on the right, which for some reason it disappeared. All right. So it it goes away. Right. <laughs> Tripling is a bit shy, so excuse me. Um, so basically, you can combine objects which are animated and rendered by the computer and a video layer on the background. And if you remember a game called Mega Race 2, well, they did exactly that. Okay, they basically combined a pre-rendered video of the entire circuit, or, or rather, um, the entire circuit, and they basically placed 3D objects, which are, in this case, the cars, on top of it. And it gave you the illusion that you were playing a, a game with really high graphics, when in reality it was just a video. So they cheated. And uh, it's perfect because they, it was very successful at the time. Um, so, especially on Android, you need, or actually, let me recommend you to actually leverage the power of CSS3 keyframe animations on the video tag. Okay. I cannot stress this enough, okay? CSS3 keyframe animations work really, really well in Android. It has great performance. So if, you know, if possible, try to combine both approaches. Another tip, if possible, paint on demand, okay? There's no need to paint the entire thing 60 times per second. There's no need. Just paint on demand. Paint when things change. That's all I need to say. Um, a small tip: avoid using get image data and put image data. They, they are extremely slow, very very slow. And use as many layers as you may need to keep the clear and paint calls as low as possible. Okay. Just use as many layers as you may need, right? If you need to use 10, 15, 20 different canvas subjects, do so, please, cheat, but make it look well, all right? Um, now, I recommend you to don't aim for 60 frames per second because in mobile devices, you want it be able to make it work that fast, all right? So you should target 24 or 30 frames per second, and you need to design your graphics accordingly, all right? You need to design your graphics to look right when being shown at 24 or 30 frames per second. And just a small tip, artificially cap to 20 frames per second during development and just before you release your product to the wild, just remove that cap, and your game will just feel much smoother when you release it. Let's talk about application responsiveness. Uh, this is an extremely critical uh, topic. A jerky user interface can ruin the entire game experience. Okay. Um, Again, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Use HTML5 for the UI. That's what it was made for, okay? It was made to draw user interfaces, okay? So try to use HTML and CSS when possible, even if your game 
uh, is made using Canvas. Okay, use it for the uh, the user interface, basically. Profile your code, look for bottlenecks, and monitor memory usage. Okay. Um, another technique that you can use is object pooling. Basically, this all come down. This all comes down to um, when you have limited resources. Okay. You have limited memory and limited CPU cycles and uh, limited audio channels, for example. It's, it would be a, gr a, a good idea to um, basically define some sort of object that allows us to reuse instances of other objects. So in this case, this code uh, is available on, in my GitHub account. Um, in this case, this code is showing uh, a sound utility. And you can basically define a limit, okay? Don't use more than three audio objects. Try to reuse those three audio objects all the time. And if you need to play more than three sounds simultaneously, just cue the sound. And as soon as one of the um, the current sounds being played simultaneously uh, finishes, just grab the first um, item from that queue and play it. So you can re basically reuse this similar approach everywhere using Canvas. You know, using uh, you can use it for uh, particle collisions, for particle generation and so on. Uh, it's very, very useful and it works very, very well. Okay. Um, that's the next part of the object pooling. Um, another critical point. Never, ever instantiate new objects in loops. Okay. Try to avoid this current scenario at all costs. This particular thing will make your game run very, very slow. So try to instantiate objects before you start your game, okay? Use uh, the loading process is not your enemy, it's actually your friend, okay? So use it to actually load things um, and you can basically instantiate all the objects you may need, and you can fill the object pools with uh, instances of objects that are ready to be reused, everything in the loading process, okay? Now, um, you must, like I said before, you you must try to keep your update loop as clean as possible, right? You need to use object pools in a very smart way. You, like I said before, if you uh, don't in create new instances, new object instances in update loops or paid loops, you're going to be fine. And if you use object pools in a smart way, you're going to be even better. Um, you can pre-generate and cache values in an array. Okay, for example, uh, the root or the power of two or three of several integers that you might use within your game. And like I said before, if possible, let the loading routine take care of the instantiation of objects. So that's about it. That's, um, there are many other things that I can talk about, but um, we are running short on time, so I'm going to be wrapping this up. So, uh, thank you very, very much. If you have any questions, please um, ask, ask them, and um, I'll try to answer as many as I can. Great. Thank you so much, Andre. That was a great webcast. Thank you for sharing your tips and knowledge with us all. We do have a few questions that have come in. They are in the Q&A tab. Are you able to see them? 
Uh, yes, yes I can. Uh, hold on, let me open it. All right. Let me pick just one of these. Um, Alfredo Delgado asks, do you use an emulator for Android 2.3 or do you recommend the purchase of a second-hand device? Personally, if you can afford the device, buy the device and try to use that device in its own context, okay? Just uh, um, try to use it on the bus, uh, try to use it on the bathroom, try to use it um, in your lunch break, you know, try to Basically, basically understand how the device works in that particular context using your particular game and try your game in different contexts using that device. And this is very important. Try it with different connection speeds. Try it with 3G, 3G and over Wi-Fi. Okay, so I strongly recommend you to get a second-hand device. They are quite cheap lately, so, um, let's see, what else, Mark sense. all right, perfect. Uh, George Vista asks, does HTML5 support 2D, 3D for RTS games? Um, RTS, uh, by RTS, do you mean real-time strategy games? Um, if you are still connected, well, I can't see him answering. That's okay. Oh well, um, if he's talking about real-time strategy games, yes, you can actually do real-time strategy strategy games um, using HTML5. Uh, you can either use Canvas or what GL there um some time ago actually a couple of months ago it came out um, a very impressive demonstration of a common and conquer one clone made using the campus object which was absolutely brilliant I loved it so you you can all right um let's see are there any example files associated with this presentation besides the actual slideshow? Well, yes, uh, you can check out my GitHub account. Um, let me, um, first of all, hold on. I'm going to try to find a reliable link here. it for you. It's basically the URL to my GitHub account. Okay. Save. And all right. Let me preview. Okay, perfect. Let me push it to you. Let's see if this works. That's the link that you should use to access my GitHub account. Okay? So click on that link and it will take you to a particular repo story that I have, um, which is making isometric real time games, uh, um, making isometric social real time games with HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript, and many of the things I have talked about today are implemented here. So I strongly suggest you to check it out. 
Let's see if we have any other questions. Um, what does isometric mean? The line is not opening the question. Right. What does isometric mean? An isometric, um, it's actually a type of projection. Okay. Um, I, how to explain it? Let's see. Isometric could be explained as a sort of projection that it is rendered from um, a 45 degree angle. Okay, I strongly suggest you to uh, um, look up on Wikipedia isometric projection. Okay, and that will tell you everything you might want to know about it. Most games. Uh, usually use another sort of projection, which is called a dimetric projection, which is basically that instead of being a square, our uh, tiles are half as tall as they are as wide. Okay, so that they most of them uh, are using a projection type called dimetric. So technically speaking, it would be making Dimetric social real-time games with HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript, but obviously um, all the people, or rather most people, call them isometric games. Um, let's see if we have any other questions. Um, do you use JavaScript frameworks when building games? I personally like. Um, Crafty JS myself, uh, but you can also use Impact JS or Isogenic. Okay, Isogenic Engine. They are both excellent. Um, they are paid. Okay, but they are both excellent. And Crafty is also great. Uh, they have a, a huge community behind them, and they might be able to to help you out with any problems that you may have. So. Um, I, I personally prefer Crafty. Um, but if you just need the rendering part, um, I personally prefer to use uh, 3.js um, by Mr. Mr. Dubs 3.js. Um, but that, that takes care of just the rendering. Not, it's not um, a game engine. And JavaScript, frame, JavaScript frameworks in general, I, I don't use any framework at all. I, sometimes I use jQuery, but um, that, that's it, I think. So let's see. Let's refresh one more time. No, that's it. So, well, I'm done, I think. <laughs> so thanks, everyone. Perfect. Andre, thank you so much again for such an outstanding webcast today, for sharing all your tips and expertise with us. We'd like to thank our audience that attended today and hope you benefited from today's webcast. We'd like to remind you all, we did push it in the group chat for you, and we'll say it verbally as well. Andre's book is the O'Reilly Deal of the Day. That means you can get it at a really good price today. Visit O'Reilly.com. You can't miss it. It's right there. Click on the link. And if you like what you heard today, that book is filled with a lot more detail and information for you all. Again, thank you, Andre. Thank you, everyone. This will conclude today's webcast. Goodbye, everybody.